Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to the eighth webinar in our series. My name is Anuth Naushan, Project Manager of Courage to Act. Courage to Act is a two-year national initiative to address and prevent gender-based violence on post-secondary campuses in Canada. It builds on the key recommendations within Possibility Seed's vital report, Courage to Act, developing a national framework to prevent and address gender-based violence at post-secondary institutions. Our project is the first national collaborative of its kind to bring together experts and advocates from across Canada to end gender-based violence on campus. A key feature of our project is our free professional webinar series where we invite leading experts to discuss key concepts and share promising practices on ending gender-based violence on campus. Supported by Caucus, these webinars are also a recognized learning opportunity Attendance at 10 or more live webinars will count towards an online certificate. Our project is made possible through generous support and funding from the Department for Women and Gender Equality Wage, Federal Government of Canada. We begin today's webinar by acknowledging that this work is taking place on and across the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. We recognize that gender-based violence is one form of violence caused by colonization to marginalize and dispossess Indigenous peoples from their lands and waters. Our project strives to honor this truth as we work towards decolonizing this work and actualizing justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls across the country. I want to pause now and invite everyone to take a deep breath. This work can be challenging and this topic hard. Many of us may have our own experience of survivorship and of supporting those we love and care about who have experienced gender-based violence. A gentle reminder here to be attentive to our well-being as we engage these difficult conversations. And so before I introduce our speaker today, a brief note on the format. Dr. Ko will speak for 40 minutes, and I invite you to, to enter questions and comments into the question and answer box, and I will monitor this, and together we will pose these questions to Dr. Ko at the end of the presentation. This will happen in the last 15 minutes. At the end of the webinar, you will find a link to, to an evaluation form. We'd be grateful if you take a few minutes to share your feedback as it helps us improve. This is anonymous. Following the webinar, I will also email you with a copy of the evaluation form and a link to the recording so you can view the webinar and share it with your networks. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Imogen Ko was the founding Dean of the Faculty of Science from 2012 to 2018, and is a professor of chemistry and biology at Ryerson University in Toronto. She is also an affiliate scientist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, where her research group studies how certain drugs get into cells. In addition to being an academic scientist, Dr. Ko is well known as an advocate for a more diverse and inclusive world of science in the post-secondary sector and beyond. She's very much in demand as a speaker and has received numerous awards for her advocacy work. It's my pleasure now to turn it over to Dr. Imogen Ko. It's delightful to be here. I'm um, very thrilled to be working with the Courage to Act team and Possibility Seeds. This is very important work. And I think this particular conversation around science, gender-based violence, harassment in science is long overdue in Canada. We've got a lot of work to do and I'm happy to help um, shed some light on the issue. So I want to go back to the title of the talk, The Trouble with Girls in the Lab, because it's actually a quote that was made by a Nobel Prize winning scientist, a British biochemist, Dr. Tim Hunt, a very successful scientist, a very highly awarded scientist, who said, allegedly jokingly, that the trouble with girls in the lab is you fall in love with them, they fall in love with you, and when you criticize them, they cry. There was a big, this was in 2015, there was a, a big outcry about this statement. He said it was just a joke, that he didn't really mean it, that he always supported women. And I just want you to hang on to that comment that it was just a joke, because this is really reflective of some of the issues that communities have to deal with in terms of exclusionary behavior in, in the science, sciences. 
I also want to introduce a couple of terms. We talk about science, but I'm also going to talk about STEM. And STEM is an acronym that's used to describe science, technology, engineering, and math. It tends to be used in Canada and the US uh, more so. And you'll hear the term STEM in uh, the UK and Australia, which is adding medicine onto the end of that. So we're really talking about the sciences, including the applied sciences, such as engineering, I don't know why math, the language of science is separated out here, and technology, I think, was included as computer science really started to take off. This acronym has been around for a few decades now, and it's widely used, although sometimes it's not the most useful acronym. But we do use it, so I'm introducing it here. Um, I also want to provide some information about myself in that I am an academic scientist. I have pursued my passion, which is curiosity about the world around us. I'm very fortunate to have been able to pursue a career as a successful academic scientist. And I think that's really important because when you may be dealing with um, scientists in your work as student services professionals, you may come across this concept that somehow you're not a successful scientist if you've gone into this policy work or you've gone into science communication or you're some kind of failure as a scientist if you're talking about this diversity stuff. Uh, and that's not the case. You can be a very successful, very accomplished scientist and also be able to understand how science sits within the bigger context of society. And in fact, we want scientists who are aware, aware of the world around them and self-aware. So we want accomplished scientists, people like me, um, Science Society pre president, uh, reviewer, all of the things that are the metrics and the measures of successful science. But we also want scientists who are self-aware and can bring, for instance, their lived experience to their understanding of the way science is done and the questions we're asking and that kind of thing. And so I've added here that I have also experienced sexual harassment as a scientist. It impacted my ability to do the work I was expected to be doing, particularly as a postdoc in a big American lab in that case. Um, and so I've also I experienced it, I've seen it happening in science, and I've also experienced partner violence, domestic violence, as a woman. Um, so I bring that as a, as a lived experience uh, as well. And I say that these days, it was a long time ago, but I say that because it's really important to understand that scientists, what goes on in science, science students, are just human beings like the rest of the population, the rest of society, and things happen to scientists and within the science disciplines like they do in other parts of the world, other parts of society. So these are really important aspects to, to understand um, and to recognize that uh, scientists are human beings and um, are fallible and flawed like everybody else. I will also recognize here that I have tremendous white privilege I have, um, while I've experienced challenges, they are not on the basis of the color of my skin. Um, and when we look at things through an intersectional lens, then we must really be aware that many of the issues are amplified if you are uh, a woman of color, a scientist of color, a queer woman in science, um, an indigenous woman in science, uh, then this is really, really important to apply that intersectional approach. So in, um, in parallel with my passion for science, I have an acquired expertise, a lived experience, and a deep training and scholarship on both science and the issues around the culture of science and organizational culture and organizational cultural change. And what is the culture of science? Uh, what does it look like? How can we understand it? So I have really a, a dual parallel career, um, particularly now in terms of having expertise in equity, diversity and inclusion in STEM. And I just want to remind everybody that just because you're a woman in STEM or a woman in science doesn't make you an expert on equity in science. And that's something that we're not very good at in Canada. We think that, you know, oh, you're a woman in science, so you must be an expert on this equity stuff, or you're, you're the only black woman in, the, in our department. So we'll put you on all of the committees around uh, equity issues. And, and that's, not necessarily the case. You can have a very um, important lived experience. We must listen to those lived experience, but don't expect those individuals to be equity experts or have equity expertise. And so scientists must go to the equity experts, which are 
you know, in place in all the universities and colleges across the universe, across the, across Canada, um, to uh, advance this kind of work. So um, it's important to recognize just because you're a woman in science, particularly a white woman in science, it doesn't make you an expert. So just something to be aware of. And we do know that the culture of STEM and medicine in many parts of the world is not conducive to equity. We, we, we can tell this, we know this, we've heard this, um, and we know that this is not a good thing. We're missing out on talent. We're missing out on questions. We, we have um, issues around the incredibly under-researched aspects of women's health. Um, all sorts of evidence and data that tell us that there is a lack of participation and, and that there is an exclusionary culture. So it's not even that, um, uh, the, the women, you know, we often hear girls aren't interested. Girls, babies, kids are interested uh, in uh, all aspects of human creativity, but there's an exclusionary culture which eventually drives them out. We have data on these issues. We have global data um, from organizations like the UN or UNESCO. Um, and we have a lot of research on culture, on impact, on solutions towards changing cultures and increasing participation rates and increasing uh, cultures of care. Um, but acting on that research is challenging in Canada because we're actually not even talking about the fact that we have issues. So if we look at some of the data, which I said that I would do, uh, one of the biggest studies and one of the most useful studies came out recently and it came out of the US and it is a massive study that was driven by three enormous academies of the disciplines of interest here. So these are massive national organizations that represent the disciplines of um, science, of engineering and of medicine, who did a massive study with a very prestigious committee that oversaw this, tons of data collection, and they looked at the sexual harassment of women. This is one 300 pages long, um, but it's a very um, sobering read. It's a very useful resource. Bottom line is that this report found that 58 and one half of the women in science, engineering, and medicine, in medicine in the academy have experienced sexual harassment. That number is second only to the military, which is at about 69%. So the number, the proportion of women in these disciplines that have experienced sexual harassment is right up there at the top of the list of, um, of cultures that are exclusionary or cultures of sexual harassment, second only to the military. And just remember that this was written by and for STEM professionals, and here are the categories that they describe of sexually harassing behavior. Gender harassment, <clears throat> so everything from abusive language to unwanted sexual attention to sexual coercion. So when I talk about this, um, the range of what we're talking about in terms of gender-based violence, it's everything from abusive, hostile language to rape. So harassing behavior can be direct or it can be ambient, it can be a culture of exclusion, and this is what we're talking about. And the rates then are very high in science, engineering, and medicine as measured in, in, the, in the US. We have a public consciousness of what that might mean um, in terms of um, gender-based violence in, in, in these disciplines. So we know, you know that it can extend to issue, issues around rape, sexual assault, but it's important to recognize there are all sorts of other things happening in science. This is from this US report, sexist insults, women don't belong in science, uh, insults to working mothers, you can't do this job with small kids at home. I actually received that in terms of an academic leadership position. You can't do this, wait till your kids are grown up. Not somebody else's call. <laughs> um, and so a nude image is posted at work, another thing that, that I've heard, um, has actually happened. So we know that these things are happening and these things are described in this report. If we take a look at the UK, again, a couple of years ago, the Royal Society of Chemistry, so now a specific discipline, but again, a leadership group, a group that said, hmm, we've got an issue here, we better take a look at it, did a big survey and they looked at the retention of women in the pipeline and some of the issues that were raised were things like bullying, discrimination and harassment. And they described these things as, as exhausting. These things uh, were uh, disincentive to stay in this discipline. Um, derogatory shaming in front of colleagues um, and little help, little clear guideline within this sector, within this discipline of where to go, what to do, and a lot of fear of retribution. 
And these are very common themes that we hear um, over and over again. There's not much reason to think that the disciplines are that different in Canada. And I can tell you that anecdotally over many years, I have heard and be told of stories of sexual assault, unwanted groping, stroking at conferences, lab work, unwanted sexual um, discussions. This could be undergraduate labs, it could be graduate, graduate level, I would say graduate level is deeply problematic. Field work, well known to be a high risk area for sexual harassment or gender-based violence in the sciences. Classes and lectures, a number of stories of, of women being told um, that they don't belong, examples being used in, um, in lectures, um, uh, postdoctoral research, sabotage of women's equipment. I mean, actually sabotaging uh, the ability for women to do the work. Um, and this is the one, academic leadership positions. I, I was told that, yes, I'd be great at this, but not yet because my kids were small and, and therefore I had to, you know, I wasn't, wasn't a good candidate. So anecdotally, we know that these things are going on. And actually, thanks to the tremendous work of um, some NSERC uh, Women in Science and Engineering chairs across the country, Jennifer Dengate and colleagues, um, we now have some data to say, yes, it's actually going on um, and women are experiencing and seeing things like derogatory gender related comments at much higher proportions to men. So here are the, here are the female numbers. We can see much higher proportion uh, of experiencing or seeing um, this kind of harassment compared to men. And this is a quite a common theme as well that I will say I hear quite a lot is that um, I've heard even from a Dean of Science at one time saying, I had no idea. I had no idea there were these issues. I had no idea there was a problem. And so there's a sense that if you don't see it or you don't experience it, it's actually not happening. But we can see that it is happening. There's um, observed harassment discrimination going on. And this is another one um, for, that, that describes derogatory um, comments, gender related comments to instructors. Um, disrespectful behavior towards female instructors. Look at this, it's almost three quarters of female instructors. And this is a survey done um, in Atlantic Canada, in universities in Atlantic Canada, um, collecting feedback from women in um, science, natural science engineering in those areas. And we, so we can see that there is um, a much, that women see and experience gender-based violence, sexual harassment, everything from abusive language to physical, um, abuse. Um, they experience it at much higher rates, but they're often questioned as to the prevalence and to the veracity. Is it really true? Did you really see that? Maybe you misunderstood. Um, I don't think that's happening. I think it was just a joke. Um, I think you, you know, you're probably overreacting. So th this is certainly something that's going on that we need to be aware of. And really, do we need to collect data? We know that gender-based violence in science and engineering medicine has a long history in Canada. We need to name these women. We need to never ever forget that these women were murdered on the basis of being women in engineering, of being women in a place where the perpetrator felt that they should not be, they did not belong. And we must we must accept this, we must acknowledge this, and we must remember that even though that was 30 years ago, we're still dealing with the kind of culture and the kind of messaging um, that still says that women don't belong or they shouldn't be here. So this is from a few years back at York University, progressive engineering school had artwork commissioned for, in memory of, um, to commemorate th this event, and it was vandalized. Um, and so to their credit, a lot of work was done to bring in um, people to help them understand why this was a problem, what's going on here. And we're still seeing it even at the 30 year anniversary of these events. We're still seeing misogynistic slurs written to say, yeah, women don't belong. You're not there, it's, you shouldn't be there. Um, and it took 30 years. I mean, this is, this is appalling and shocking. It took 30 years for us to get to the point where we could go from naming it as a tragic event, which is what the plaque says in Montreal, from a tragic event to a crime against feminism. Call it what it is. So let's stop being passive aggressive. Let's stop being so Canadian and polite, which hides a whole lot of things. 
let's start being really honest and let's start having the conversations about the culture that we have here that says what girls and boys, disenfranchises boys as well, but let's start talking about what the culture is that says who can be where um, and who can do what and what they should look like. So we have to recognize that culture and context are hugely influential. Just because you grow up with cats doesn't mean that, you know, it will influence the way you behave. Just because something has always been that way doesn't make it okay. It's the worst reason for keeping things the way they are is because they've always been that way. And it is culture and context because if you look at other parts of the world, people don't behave that way. So if we look at Eastern Europe, when girls do physics. It's just like doing um, cooking or sewing or whatever. It's nothing strange about physics and math um, and engineering for girls and women in other parts of the world. So cultures and contexts really make a difference. And you can turn these, um, these, these truths, these fundamental truths into questions about your situation. If you're working with students, it's like, well, you know, what is the context? So you have a women in science group. Uh, that's great. That creates community. But what is the culture they're actually working with? What are you trying to deal with? Because maybe what you need is a healthy masculinity group as well. Casual sexism is pervasive in Canada like it is elsewhere in society. I have used this slide on the left here many times in talks and it's very interesting to see whether it elicits um, laughter. I'll sometimes have a bunch of guys in engineering who will laugh out loud, that's hilarious. And then I'll have other groups and other audiences who will just look stony faced and will we'll, we'll, we'll relate to it, I think. Um, and so the culture and the casual sexism is that it's just an ad. It's just a joke, right? It's just a joke. Girls in the lab, they cry. Or it's just an internet. Or it's just a TV show. Here is a great uh, space astrophysicist who um, works for the European Space Agency. A whole team put a robot on an asteroid. A tremendous achievement. Tremendous technical achievement. He goes on global television for an interview. And he has this shirt on, which has these hypersexualized women, cartoon images, and um, obviously social media took them to task. Um, but would you feel comfortable working with that person with that kind of projecting that kind of image in a lab? It's just a shirt. It's just a shirt, but it's also just a toy. It's just a phrase. It's just, it's just everything. And so it's the thousand tiny cuts that can really create a culture that says, you know what, I don't belong here and I'm going to give up. And that is a problem. And it leads to um, a sort of a, a culture that says it's okay to be derogatory, it's okay to, to um, be abusive, it's okay to use um, sexually inappropriate language. Um, and the cultures can be persistent. So Frosh Week is a great example. Um, and yeah, okay, it's a big party, um, but, but it's kind of over the top. And you know, it's, it's even one that's over the top. It's sexist and violent and degrading. And then some of the stuff I've heard engineering students say has been really problematic and it just can lead to extremely serious, devastating, life impacting kinds of events that some of which make the news, but many of which go underreported. And we know the Whisper Network in, in Canada is, is extensive and loud. We know that these things are going on and often they don't reach levels where we can, we can actually um, hold people accountable. So we need to be addressing the culture. We need to be supporting our students in STEM, but we also need to be addressing the culture. This is from Waterloo, University of Waterloo, just last year. I'm a first year female engineering student trying to help some guys with a math concept, but they didn't like the fact that I knew what I was doing um, and they turned their backs. So this student, looking for tips on putting up with being constantly dismissed and looked over for being a girl. So, you know, just a year ago on a Reddit thread. Um, your Waterloo has actually tried to address this by addressing culture and looking at, for instance, you know, what does it mean to be a young man in engineering? Why do we have this weird frosh culture in Canada? It doesn't exist where I come from. So what does it mean to be a young man in, in um, engineering? What does it mean to be a young woman in engineering? Um, but particularly, let's talk about, you know, social constructs of masculinity. And I really am a big proponent of addressing culture and context and bringing these people into the conversation and really helping people to develop a self-awareness. 
to shift the focus from the deficit model of fixing girls to developing healthy behaviors and attitudes in boys in STEM. That would really be a huge um, step forward. And it's not, I picked on engineering a lot because we have a lot of data on engineering, but we've well established culture of bullying in medicine, um, long history in chemistry, um, to their credit, now really beginning to address some of the kind of mean culture in chemistry. And this is just an example in physics from a colleague at uh, Carlton who reports that um, she heard a respected scientist, or she overheard a respected scientist who when Donna Strickland won her Nobel Prize for physics, his comment was, he's surprised because another world-class renowned male optics expert had been overlooked, maybe because he was not a woman. The implication being obviously she didn't deserve it. She only gets it because she's a woman and this sort of political correctness gone mad. And so just this culture that says all the time, you're not good enough. You shouldn't be here. Why is this a problem in science particularly? Well, it's a problem in science because scientists base their professional identities on being objective and forgetting that they're human. And we look to the social sciences. We look to the humanities. We look to behavioral psychology and behavioral economics to, to understand how humans behave. And scientists are very resistant to accepting and believing the data and evidence in support of gender bias. They maintain a firm belief in meritocracy, which we all know is a myth. Um, and despite the ample evidence that there is bias, they hang on to this concept that they are objective. So I've had many colleagues say, I never look at gender when I'm looking at a CV. If a student's going to come work in my lab for the summer, I just pick the best student. Um, well, they don't. They're, we all are human beings, so we all have biases. Um, I've had lots of colleagues say, I don't see color, which, you know, and this lack of self-awareness is, is considered to be sort of a, you know, positive characteristic. It's the, the, we're objective as scientists. Well, if you were understanding that you're human and you could actually calibrate against the biases that we all have, you'd actually truly be heading towards more objectivity. So it's sometimes a real challenge to deal with scientists and engineers and science students will pick this up as well, because this concept of objectivity and, and separateness from the world is something that defines them as being a scientist. Scientists and engineers are products of their environment, Opinions, attitudes, political leanings will influence behaviors. This should not surprise any of us. I collect stories. I have been giving talks across the country for many years now, and every time I would go to give a talk at an institution, a, a college, a university, a division, a department, I, somebody would come up to me afterwards and they would tell me their story. And this page is just two years worth, 2015, 2017, of things people told me in Canada that they had experienced. Not always women, not uh, often they are white women, there's a lot of privilege. White women could be, white women in science can be um, incredibly bullying. White women in science can be part of the problem. There's a lot of internalized patriarchy amongst white women in science. But there is a persistent culture that says, hmm, not sure you should be here. Maybe you should drop out and roll in arts and find a husband. You know, I like you in the lab because you work harder and I can pay you less. Um, and I just want to focus on the last one here because this is actually the last couple of years. This is the last 12 months. Um, demeaning, belittling language by peers leading to uh, personality clashes or breakdown, which resulted in a graduate student leaving violent visual images on another student's desk. Um, male, female student harassing and, and being quite, um, leaving violent images on the desk. For sexual, her, sexual harassment, persistent sexual harassment leading to limited time doing lab work, coerced sexual activity in lab facilities after hours, and sexual assault on field courses. So you won't have heard of these, I don't make the press, but I think it's really clear that we need to be honest about what is going on and what the cultures are that some of our students and people are dealing with. I'm aware that there are some people who have signed up and who may be on this call for whom this list of experiences may be very uh, affecting. So Anuth and I decided at this point we would take a break just to let everybody 
maybe catch their breath, get a drink of water and just sit with some of those feelings because I know this can be very triggering and very difficult and painful for some people who may be listening in. So I'm just gonna take like a short break here for people just to take a breath. Okay, so if I can bring everybody back. I also want to let you know that I'm available if you want to reach out, talk to me, DM me, I'm on Twitter, I'm on social media. Uh, there are people out there to support you and to, sh and to listen to your experiences. Um, can't always find solutions, but certainly there is a network that is very committed to supporting people in science, young people, trainees, students, particular in science. Okay, I wanna move on a little bit to what can you do if say you're, you're working in the student um, services, professional professions, you're one of those individuals. Um, what can you do in terms of actually um, addressing issues of gender-based violence in STEM. And I think one of the first things is to acknowledge um, that, ex that it exists, that, ex that this is a reality. My Dean of Science friend, who is a very good person, who said to me, I had no idea, I had no idea any of this could happen. That's the first step. Yeah, it happens. We like to think of Canada as being very progressive and. And, and very, you know, diversity is our strength. But the reality is we're still human beings and we're flawed and fallible. And we have a culture, we have an exclusionary societal culture for women in STEM. Just look at how we gender stereotype our children, go into any clothing store, go into any toy store and look at the toys, look at the books, look at, you know, clothes, that, how we gender stereotype our children. The messages that the girls and boys are getting start before they're born. I think it's also really important to recognize that the, the practice, the discipline of science um, across the, the different sciences um, is perhaps a little bit conducive to high risk or more riskier kinds of settings. So lab work can involve long hours um, in the lab, um, in, or you know, you need to go use a telescope or you need to go to a computer lab. Um, there might be long hours there with small numbers of, of people. Um, some of those facilities might have restricted access. You need to go use the telescope. Well, it's not, it's not going to be hundreds of people there. You need to go use the microscope room. Um, and this uh, can be problematic. Um, and so the lab work or the field work um, can be contexts that can be conducive to gender-based violence. Um, summer internships is another place where um, those long hours out time out in the field might be um, uh, you know, a factor. And there are very hier hierarchical structures. So undergraduates working for graduate students, graduate students working for postdocs, postdocs working for, for professors. Um, hierarchical um, structures, enormous power imbalances, and not very clear mechanisms of what to do when problems come up. Science is full of opportunity for abuse, dark rooms, microscope rooms, computer labs, field work, um, what is the department program? What are people putting in place to protect against gender-based violence in these kinds of situations? 
Field stations locations can be very remote. You may be out there with one or two other people, maybe one other people. There could be extended time away from others, students going up to the Arctic to work, going out into remote locations, or even working in um, field locations close to home, but, own, but in very isolated or very small groups with, with very little in the way of training around what does gender-based violence, what does sexual harassment actually mean? And this is for everybody. This is for men and women. And field, field sciences, the geosciences, the environmental sciences, the field biology have a significant recorded history of abuse. Not so much in Canada because we don't keep track of it, but certainly in the US and other parts of the world, lo lots and lots of recorded uh, issues around field work. Power imbalances. And the other one I put here is conferences. So um, not exclusive to, to science, but conferences are a place where I've worked really hard to get science to start paying attention to codes of conduct. And I know within the last couple of years of situations where alcohol um, and uh, a mix of, of sort of demographics um, in terms of trainees, young people, students at risk, um, have led to high risk situations. I've had a colleague had to step in and actually physically extract a student who was being sexually harassed from, um, from a social function happening at a conference. So these are situations that can be highly problematic. And science and engineering, we do a lot of conferences. We love our conferences. So we need to be really aware about those things and make sure that people have the core competencies and the skill sets and that the structures are set up to ensure that the cultures are cultures of care. What can you do? Acknowledge it's real. Acknowledge that there is precedent data. There's a ton of evidence. Believe those that share the stories. There's a lot of gaslighting that goes on. There's a lot of, you must have misunderstood. I was told that. I was told I must have misunderstood what somebody meant when they continually kept asking me to go out for drinks and they would tell other people in the research institute where I was working what they wanted to do to me, where and in what part of the research institute. Uh, I don't think I misunderstood any of that, but I was told that by several people. Um, there's contradiction, contradicting messaging. Uh, it's just a joke. You just misunderstood. You can't take a joke. People are always going to say nasty things. You need to get over it. Um, that's a reality. And I think particularly in Canada, I would say be prepared for epic levels of ignorance on the topic of GBV in STEM. I mean, we just are not talking about it. This is the first time I have talked about GBV in STEM in Canada, and I've given 300 talks in the last uh, many years uh, on equity, diversity, inclusion. So we really are not talking about it, and we don't have the skills. We're, not, we're still building out the core competencies in both men and women in STEM. Please be aware of the intersectional aspects. White women in STEM, bit of a history of bullying. Um, there can be sexual harassment from women and white women in STEM are, need to be part of the solution, just like the rest of the population. Be prepared for the myth of objectivity by scientists and engineers. Um, we're human beings, not evil people. We're human beings, we're flawed and fallible. And really work towards cultures of care. So there's quite a lot of scholarship around cu developing cultures of care. A lot of it's coming out of um, uh, medicine. How can we develop cultures of care? Uh, what does that look like? What are the organizational structures we need? And I'm a big fan right now, and I get asked a lot about this. What can I do if I see something happening to my friend? Um, bystander training, um, allyship training. I've been asked a lot by young men in science actually around what can I do? How do I deal with a sexist comment? How do I deal with, with my friend being continually harassed? Um, and so I think there's a capacity there. Healthy masculinity training. Graduate school is a huge area of attention that I think we need to be looking at. And core competencies for faculty. And expect resistance because people don't like to be told this is going on and they don't like to be told that they have to do some work. We really need leadership and I want to just make a shout out to, to uh, Kirsty Duncan who was the Minister of Science who really put this, these issues and issues around equity um, in science on, on the radar when she was the Minister of Science and I think we wouldn't be having some of these conversations had there not been leadership at the top that was backed by money, universities were held accountable uh, in terms of the research culture in STEM, because there was money at risk. And so we need leadership from the top. We need leadership 
at the level, at all levels, but we definitely need leadership from academic leaders. We need university leaders, college leaders to say, we're going to deal with this. And if we don't deal with it, it's going to be, there are going to be consequences and accountability. Thank you very much for your attention. And finally, be brave. Don't try to be perfect, just be brave. So Anuth, I'm going to hand it back to you now, okay? Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ko. And now I'd like our, our attendees to share any questions and comments, and you can do so by typing these um, in the box or into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Okay, wonderful. I can uh, see that we have a couple already. Um, so Dr. Ko, your first question is, what if a department or faculty or another unit wants to promote um, women in science type events and ask for our help as student services professionals? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I get asked quite a lot that for that kind of, um, you know, to, to provide help or to have my input. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in creating community. I think networking is really important and finding support um, amongst your peers, particularly if you're in um, perhaps physics or math, where you may be one of very few um, women in a, in a class or in a cohort. Um, so I think as a student prof services professional, that's a really good idea to help that. I would also ask the question though, what is it like? What is the culture like? What are your, you know, how are you treat it in the lab? You, we saw in that slide from that student at Waterloo, um, when you're the only girl in the lab or you're the only girl in the class, it can be quite isolating. And so creating community is a great thing, but what else can we do? You know, maybe what else do you think we could do? What else would be useful in terms of um, improving the culture and the, and the, and the context? So I think just asking that question and just raising that as, a, as an issue, because we spend so much time focusing on like fixing girls or you know, women in science. And really we need to be talking about, you know, uh, cultures of care in science for everybody, queer men in science, uh, transgendered women in science, um, students from different backgrounds in science. So I think it's, we can make it, we can, we can support communities, but we can also make it broader. Great, thank you. And thank you as well for the advice on how to build um, those cultures of care. So our next question is from a scientist um, in our they are working in a new academic leadership um, EDI role within their faculty, and they're interested in hearing more from you, um, Dr. Cohen, how uh, you acquired your EDI expertise and what you might recommend to a scientist interested in increasing knowledge and expertise in it. That's a great question. I, I, I get asked that a lot, actually. Um, how, we, how come you're doing all this kind of social justice work? Or sometimes it will be, um, you know, what kind of femi-nazi are you? Um, you should be a scientist. Um, I, it goes back to being raised with a strong, a strong set of values around social justice. So I've never not been somebody who paid attention to the way structures were um, including people or excluding people. So I can go back to, um, as a child, noticing that girls and boys were selected and, and sent to do different things, sewing for me and woodworking for my brother. Um, and that didn't make sense to me. So I became, I was always interested and in, I always want to know why. So it comes from a curiosity. It comes from being a scientist and wanting to know why things are the way they are. Um, and so I have done a lot of work. I, 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 it takes work. You have to read into the social sciences. You have to study the experts, you have to take the courses, you have to actually do a lot of the work, do a lot of the reading. Um, and I've done that over the last, you know, 30 or 40 years um, to really try to educate myself on issues around um, bias, and more recently on issues around um, colonization and um, reconciliation and that kind of thing. So I, I think it's a whole area of scholarship. I mean, I think I could probably, I, I think I probably have done enough scholarship to create another PhD, um, it, which is why I think it's really important to recognize that just because you're a woman in science doesn't make you an expert on, you know, gender-based violence in science. So I think you have to do the work. Sign up for every course you can find. Uh, go to every seminar or webinar you can find. Do the work. Um, learn the language. Read the social scientists. Learn about critical race theory. 
um, read Roxane Gay, um, you know, read um, the, the uh, Rachel Cargill, follow her on Instagram, um, really immerse yourself and do the work. So it takes time. Um, and I had, and the problem in science is there's no credit for this. You don't get any rewards for this. It's not part of the sort of traditional metrics. So you have to be willing to do it um, in addition to a scientific academic career, unless you're being hired as a, an EDI specialist. But then if you move out of being a credible scientist, then you get caught between these two worlds. So do the work. Great, thank you, Dr. Ko. Um, so our next question is from a postdoc student. Um, and they've asked if there's any data about postdoctoral students being targeted by these um, violent experiences because postdoctoral students are even more vulnerable. Um, the students sometimes because they're moving towards the job market and they um, may be more precarious or um, vulnerable situations. And they may also have, sorry, less uh, defensive institutions. Yes, so postdoctoral fellows is a very vulnerable sector. I think graduate students is a, it's a vulnerable sector where I've heard a lot of, a lot of stories. Um, so postdoctoral, uh, that postdoctoral sort of segment, we have really very little data in science in Canada. Um, but I think if you look at the um, NASM report, the big US report, and if you look at some of the data that come out of the UK, um, and a little bit of data out of, the U of, out of Australia, um, you can see that, yes, there is evidence, particularly um, for um, abuses, hierarchical power imbalance based abuses at the postdoctoral level. So the fear of retribution um, is very real. Um, one, of the f one of the first public things I did was actually respond to a letter in science which said my postdoc advisor keeps looking down my, my shirt, what should I do? And the advice, it was an advice column in, in the science, in science journal, the advice uh, that came back from Alice Wang was a very senior, very prominent, very celebrated um, Asian woman scientist was, that's too bad, but try and put up with it. And so I wrote a letter that took off around the world and, and no, nobody should have to put up with that. But there's a great fear of retribution. So I think, again, it comes back to the context and the culture. So institutions that are hiring postdocs have an obligation to be putting things in place that protect them. And what are the structures in place? What are the policies in place? What is it that your institution or your particular area is doing that is um, protective? And if there isn't something happening, then it needs to be raised. If po it's hard for a postdoc to do that. So that's why we need people trained with core competences and expectations of leaders to be doing these things. Um, but yes, we need to be looking at postdoctoral fellows um, because that is a vulnerable sector of, of society. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, we have a couple more questions. Um, so what are your recommendations then for policymakers, particularly uh, in terms of engaging men and boys in violence and STEM? Um, so I think there's some good work being done around um, engineering and first week. And I don't know if University of Waterloo is still doing their healthy masculinities, but um, when they were running them, those were, um, uh, those were sort of programs, workshops that were led by experts. So bring in the masculinity, healthy masculinity experts. This is not something that a man in STEM is going to run. Um, bring in the experts, offer them for free. And last time I heard about them or talked about them with somebody was a couple of years ago, they were oversubscribed. They were, um, and they had to bring in more. So there was, there's definitely interest in capacity. Um, so I, I'm a big kind of fan of that kind of approach. Um, there are a number of organizations. Promundo is very good. Um, the White Ribbon Campaign um, also talks about healthy, healthy masculinity. Bring in people who are experts and make them available. Um, I would also um, encourage champions in the depart in your departments or in your institutions to actually say things out loud. And I'll give you an example of where this made a difference. We had at Ryerson a nasty incident with computer science students who uh, were quite abusive to women in computer science labs to the extent that they physically got up and left. There were also homophobic comments. I asked, when I was dean, I asked the chairs of computer science um, uh, chemistry and biology to, and physics probably, to speak to, um, to their classes. To, I, I asked men in specifically, would you speak to the, your classes and say, we have a zero tolerance for this kind of behavior in 
this faculty. We have a zero tolerance. We will not put up with it because I need a man to say that to a class that, have, that has male students in it. Um, my chemistry and biology professor is like, yeah, of course, we'll do that. No problem. I, I would even give them a script if they needed. Um, and they did. And for the most part, the students in those classes kind of said, yep, okay, we get that. Um, my computer science faculty really struggled with that. Couldn't do it. Even with a script, were uncomfortable, was not something that was familiar to them. But you need to get men engaged in talking to men. I will also say that the Ontario Society for Professional Engineers, the professional engineers are really very engaged in this. And I will say that if the employers would come in and say, we don't want computer science students that graduate who don't get this. We don't want engineers who graduate who don't understand societal issues. Um, that would be really helpful. So having potential future employers come back and say, this is a core competency you boys, you men need to have. We're looking for that just as much as we're looking for your technical skills. That would be really helpful as well. Slow to do that in Canada. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and so our next question is uh, just a recognition that this is an issue that hasn't been talked about very much in at all. And, um, Dr. Koh, can you give some other examples of perhaps actions of other jurisdictions? Actions of, sorry, I missed the last part of what you said. Oh, they, uh, the question was around examples of actions in other jurisdictions. Um, so I imagine those are probably resources or projects tackling this. Right. So I think there's a couple of ways you can incentivize the behaviors you want or and or and you can have consequences for the behaviors that you don't want so in the u.s there is a process called title nine which is um, a mechanism as a policy structure that says if an institution has been found guilty of creating an environment that allowed sexual harassment or gender-based violence to happen they will lose money. Um, Title IX is not perfect, but it does work in some circumstances that it allows universities to actually hold people accountable for really bad behavior. We don't have quite, we don't have a Title IX in Canada, um, but we could have stronger policies in place um, to hold institutions accountable. And right now in sciences, we're really doing that at the federal level because the federal government will say we'll withdraw your research money and scientists don't well, scientists and engineers don't like that um institutions universities sit under provincial jurisdiction provincial mandate they sit education as a provincial mandate so between the provinces there can be all sorts of different kinds of approaches to dealing with this um so the the how you deal with these particular issues is going to be very jurisdictional dependent, context dependent. What you can do at your institution may depend on what kind of union structure you have. It can be very, very difficult to hold faculty accountable um, because they are protected by a collective agreement in terms of um, you know, their employment. So it can be very difficult, which is why we want to create cultures of care. So we want to you know, focus on preventive approaches. Um, in other jurisdictions, it can be easier um, if somebody isn't protected by a particular, you know, type of agreement. Academic freedom is used as a cover for all sorts of bad behavior, um, which is too bad because we need academic freedom. Um, so it's a, you know, this toolkit, toolkit of incentives, consequences, accountability, uh, core competencies. Really, if people had the skill set, knew how to behave, then we'd be better off. Thank you, Dr. Ko. Um, so Marina I was wondering if there, if you knew of any specific data around gender-based violence um, in STEM students. Um, in Canada, I don't think, I don't, I'm not aware of gender-based violence in science uh, for students. I'm not aware of data that we have in Canada. There are some data in um, the US um, and there are some, there's some reporting um, in the UK, um, but we're, you know, we're very data poor in Canada. There's lots of anecdotal data. Um, there's lots of um, qualitative reporting. Um, there's some data that the, um, the, the NSERC WISE team has put together that I can, I think I added it to the list of resources. Um, much of that is 
kind of not student level. So no, we, we don't have good data. Sorry. Okay, thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this question is from Lisa, and Lisa was saying thank you for sharing your insights. And um, there's a lot to do around learning and taking action. And noting too that it's challenging work, but there's a lot of opportunities. So the question is, how are we creating learning experiences for STEM professionals and research institutions? And what recommendations do you have um, about getting this learning started strategically with the organizations? So I think you might have touched upon it earlier. As well, uh, yes, a little bit. Um, so hi, Lisa. Nice to see you behind the screen there. I hope our paths cross in real life eventually one of these days. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of work going on, but it's very uneven across the disciplines. So that's why STEM is often not somewhere where we hear a lot of stuff that's being led by the dean or the chairs or whatever around EDI initiatives. A lot of it's being driven by students um, who want to learn more, which is why I think the core competences piece is really important if we if we can get more educational opportunities in through student societies through graduate student societies postdoctoral organizations learning how to um, uh, develop these skills around EDI that's probably where we're going to get the, the biggest value for money um, it's the, the faculty in science and engineering very resistant to learning these things there are some incentives being pushed by the research um, funding agencies. So NSERC and CIHR are now expecting much more awareness and you have to demonstrate that awareness. So we're beginning to see some shifts there. Um, but I would, you know, as, as we continue to appoint, um, you know, middle-aged, middle-class, straight white guys as our presidents and as our VPs and stuff, I, I re it really has got to come from the top and it's got to be that we're creating a culture of inclusive excellence. So it doesn't matter what discipline you are, but in terms of academia or the post-secondary sector, we have a culture of care and a culture of inclusive excellence that says, yeah, you're going to be great at science, but you're also going to have these skill sets. You're going to be great at history. You're going to have all these skill sets. You're going to be great at you know, kinesiology and you're going to have these skill sets. So it becomes, it becomes the fabric of the organization. And we're really not there. We're seeing it as an add-on at the side. We're seeing it as, a, as, as something that you know, is a nice to have, but are not absolutely necessary to have. Um, and so I think, you know, again, it's the systems approach. You need, you need inputs at all of the systems. Right now, I would focus for student professionals, I would focus on opportunities for learning amongst student societies, science student societies, bystander training, allyship training, um, you know, even the vocabulary of EDI, what does it mean? What does inclusive excellence mean in science? The history of sexism and racism in science, the decolonization of science, indigenous sciences and ways of knowing um, and how they are complementary and, and so valuable. Um, and I think those opportunities with the student level, graduate student, postdoc are probably where we're going to see, we're going to be able to affect impact and really learning about intersectionality um, you know we we've got a lot of work to do with with a big chunk of the of the discipline around even what does intersectionality mean and so uh, lots of work to do great thank you dr ko so i think this takes us to the end um, of our talk today we've had a really good discussion and as you mentioned this is a breaking conversation it's one of the first conversations around addressing gbv and stem in canada so thank you for um facilitating this conversation for us and and for showing us how to build those cultures of care and um, those cultures of institutional excellence in stem and um, we've learned a lot so the recording will be available on our website in a few days and i also want to thank our participants for joining us and for sharing with us today um, we really appreciate and take inspiration from your commitment to addressing and preventing gender-based violence on campus and we feel very lucky to be able to work alongside each and every one of you um, so thank you everyone and a kind reminder to please complete the evaluation forms and we will see you at the next webinar on friday september 25th bye everyone thank take you. care